So what I'm going to discuss is this topic here. So you want to be a tech entrepreneur. Now I don't know if you really want to be a tech entrepreneur or not, but I'll assume as a premise for this, you're sitting in this class, it's one of the lecture series. We will focus on tech entrepreneurship, but we'll have some non-tech stuff here too. Uh, sort of everything is tech in one way or another in this space these days. Um, anyway, we'll, we'll try to emphasize tech a bit here. We'll also try to bring in some good women speakers and uh, um, we will have a whole variety of different kinds of folks. So let me talk a little bit about education and technology and entrepreneurship and set the stage for some of the things that you might hear as the semester goes on that might be of benefit to you. Here's the outline. I'll start with my background. I'll talk about technology entrepreneurship, some things you need to know, and then the main part is these three principles here, Metcalf's Law, Disruptive Technology, and Moore's Law and we'll talk about some directions that you might think about going from here. My background. In 1979, my dad brought home a Heath kit. It was build your computer from a kit. And I thought, man, this is kind of interesting. And we put this thing together. It looked really nice when it was done. The inside was something like this, ribbons and wires going everywhere. And I don't know if you can see all the little tiny parts, but we had to solder these together. And it was quite the mechanical project, not just a, like today if you were building a PC, You'd order a bunch of parts and plug them together and that would be your machine. Well, back here we had to have the soldering iron. It was very much a craftsy kind of a project. And I looked at that thing and I thought, now what do I do? And I'm the second out of 11 kids, which means I have a lot of younger brothers and sisters. How many of you have a younger brother or sister? Do they do everything you tell them to do? <laughs> probably not, probably not. Um, that's a fantasy if you think you're going to get your younger brothers and sisters to do everything you want. Well, I had a, I have an, a, an epiphany when I ran into this machine. It did everything I asked it to do. It didn't question, didn't give me any sass. It just did what I told it to. And I thought, hey, this is cool. And I started learning about computers and programming. And so for that many years, I've been learning about programming. And I'm still doing that. I went and got a bachelor's degree and then a PhD in computer science here at BYU. Um, I've done a, a whole ton of different kinds of software. I'm currently on the information systems faculty. I've done sabbaticals to go with local startups and, and um, do some entrepreneurship stuff myself. And I, for the last number of years, have been doing a really deep dive into mobile development. I teach, oh, I don't have it right here on me. Where is it? I teach how to program iPhones and iPads, Android devices, that kind of stuff. And I really have fun with that sort of thing. I've also spent a lot of time in startups. And BYU is the only non-startup I've ever, ever worked for. But I've been here for 19, 20 years now, and so it's been fun. Anyway, uh, so enough about me. Let's talk about entrepreneurship. If you look at the origins of the word, entrepreneur actually means undertaker which for English speakers seems like kind of not as nice a word as entrepreneur, but uh, that's, that's what it means. It's somebody who undertakes an enterprise, one who owns or manages a business. And here's the key part that I emphasize from the Oxford English Dictionary definition, a person who takes the risk of profit or loss in a company. That's the entrepreneur. Now, tech entrepreneurship, here's how I define technology entrepreneurship. It's the creation, cultivation, management of ventures who, at their core, what they're trying to do, they're building products that are based on information technology. And you all interact with that stuff every day. You are, we all, are the recipients of benefits that come from technology entrepreneurs who are out there thinking about, hey, what if I had a social network? What if I had a map that um, could tell me how to get from point A to point B? What if I had, and, and the list goes on, of Entrepreneurs have thought about problems and how do I address those? What we really want to inspire our students to do is to think about how do you create scalable ventures where what you do can easily go big. So one of the things that one of our donors, Kevin Rollins, the main donor for the, for the Rollins Center, what he said to us was, well, you know, YouTube's this great success. Why can't that happen here at BYU? Why can't we be doing that kind of stuff? So he wants us to help students to think big and figure out how do we scale uh, an idea, an opportunity, into a really cool business. 
And we have some great examples that have come out of our program. Anybody working for Domo? Josh James, the entrepreneur there, is one of our former students. Um, they sold Omniture to Adobe. He and John Pastana sold Omniture to Adobe for uh, 1.7 billion bucks a few years ago. That was a pretty cool little deal. Anyway, we've had a lot of those. And if you look around, uh, anybody here working for Qualtrics? Okay, there's a startup. Uh, Ryan Smith and his dad, uh, Scott, and, and others uh, have been working on diligently. Great startup. They're worth a billion bucks now, or in that neighborhood. Anyway, the center exists because we live, we all live in this world that's increasingly becoming networked and digitized. I always have to pinch myself a little bit when I can walk into Costco and I can buy a terabyte or a two terabyte hard drive. Remember that Heath kit, that H89 on the previous slides? Um, it had 48K of RAM, no hard drive, no floppy drive, it had a cassette tape for storage. Later we bought a floppy, but anyway, we don't need to spend time talking about how in my day it was uphill both directions and two feet of snow. Um, but I have to pinch myself when, I, when I'm driving down I-15 and I can do internet, or when I can access all of this massive storage. I can carry around in my pocket more storage than went to the moon, far more computing power than flew that rocket to the moon, et cetera. The implications of the world that we live in are really, really deep. And uh, so that's why the center exists. I'm going to skip a little bit of this here and go on to something a little bit more interesting. Now, if you're going to pursue tech entrepreneurship, what kinds of things do you need to know? Well, uh, to start off with, you need to know what is an opportunity that's worth pursuing. Ideas are a dime a dozen, they really are. We, can all, we could have an ideation exercise where I give you a paper cup and you all imagine what are the things I could do with this paper cup. And somebody will say, well, it's a flower pot or it's a hat or it's a, we could all come up with ideas. That doesn't mean those are opportunities worth pursuing. I don't think I'm gonna make a lot of money selling paper cups as hats. You know, I could be wrong, but I just don't think that's gonna happen. So the, the key is, how do we figure out how to develop opportunities that really are something that we ought to go after. And there are all kinds of startup skills. How do you create, manage, and finance your venture? How do I sell to customers? Now, maybe you feel like you've got some pretty good sales experience. We tend to have a lot of people who are pretty good at that here. Um, a lot of our students go out and do summer sales, for example, because they figured out how to knock on doors and how to accept rejection and uh, how, to, how to deal with that. Uh, but that's a key skill how do you as an entrepreneur break down those barriers and charge through the walls and get to customers and, and make money? How do you bootstrap? That is, don't raise money, but figure out a business model where you can kind of self-fund. And um, how do you build a team? The most common question I get from students who are trying to build a company, where do I find a programmer? Or you know, where do I find a fill in the role? That's a tough thing. You've got to figure out how you network and meet people. Um, and there are tons and tons and tons of different topics. As an entrepreneur, you kind of have to be the person who's responsible for everything. And sometimes you don't have enough money to hire somebody who fits a special role. And so you have to do a lot of stuff yourself, especially early. We have a lot of programs here in the Marriott School that'll help you, starting with the business minor. How many are in the business minor? Okay, so the majority of you probably. We have a business management major, uh, the, the entrepreneurship emphasis within that major. We have the information systems major, where that's where I teach. Every year we have a number of students in that program who are really entrepreneurs learning tech skills. By the way, that's a great combination because that's one of the hardest roles to try to fill, the technology skill set. And if you can develop some of that yourself, it's easier to attract that talent to your team. We have a number of graduate programs that provide, so if in the MBA program, for example, if you later come back for an MBA, we'll have an entrepreneurship emphasis that you can participate in and, and other things like that. And we try to do a lot of competitions with the Rollins Center and others to give you opportunities to learn the skills and to practice the skills. And so some of the out-of-class activities you'll see this semester will be like for the business model competition. When is that, February, uh, middle of February? Or anyway, somewhere in there. There's the mobile app competition that'll be in February also that uh, could be an out-of-class activity for you. 
we, we try to put opportunities that incentivize you to take some risk and to try some things beyond just the classes you take. Entrepreneurship is probably not best learned in a book. There is some book learning that you need to do. And in fact, entrepreneurs are avid readers. They'll typically have a long list of books that they recommend that you read. But you gotta go out there and do it. You gotta go out there and, and, and try and learn. And there'll be failures and there'll be successes. By the way, all these slides will get posted. So the stuff I'm skipping, you could look at later or whatever. In a startup situation, mentoring is a huge skill. And it's a huge um, area where you need to give back after you learn some things and can share with others. If you go to one of the startup accelerators like Techstars, where they have different teams of small groups of entrepreneurs trying to make it, one of the key elements of those programs is that there will be peer mentoring. They'll help each other. They'll say, oh, you're facing this problem that I just did a whole bunch of research on and I found the following things. They'll talk to each other a lot and there's peer mentoring that happens. We also have at the Rollins Center a whole bunch of outside entrepreneurs and that's the pool we're drawing from mostly to come in and be speakers in this class. And we can put you in contact with our mentors so that you can sit down with people who understand the problems that you're facing and you can learn from them and not make all the mistakes yourself that they've already learned how to avoid. You'll make plenty of your own mistakes no matter what, but mentoring is a vital activity in entrepreneurship. You have to receive it, you have to give it. And so that's something that we um, try to do quite a bit. Go to getmentoring.com if you wanna learn more about the mentoring program and you can just also stop by our office and talk to our staff about it. Here's some of the books that I like. The Innovator's Method, you all get to read this semester and do a, a, an activity about, so, what is it, a book report, Chase, this year? Okay. Um, Nail It and Scale It is the book we used to assign in the lecture series. It's a great little startup book. Um, Steve Blank has a book called The Startup Owner's Manual that's kind of a reference book for customer development and it complements these other books very nicely. And, and there are some others here. Lots and lots of resources. We have a library up in 470 that you can take advantage of for some of this material. We obviously don't have enough copies of the Innovator's Method for all of you to go check out the Innovator's Method for the class, but um, we have a lot of other books up there. And there's a ton of other stuff you need to learn. I'm gonna skip that. Okay, the heart of my talk. Here are three principles that if you kind of understand what's going on here, you have a pretty clear picture about some of the forces that are happening in tech entrepreneurship. These aren't all of the forces. There are some others that I'll, uh, emerging trends that I'll address at the end. But these three underlie, underlie a lot of what happens in tech entrepreneurship. There's a thing called a network effect that drives standardization. There's a thing called principles of disruptive innovation. And then there's this thing called Moore's law or exponential technology growth. And I'll talk about each of these in turn. Network effect. A network effect is something that occurs when a product becomes more valuable as more people are using that. So let's take an example of a telephone. How much good does it do me to have exactly one telephone in the world? Yeah. Not a lot of value in that. I, the only value I can come up with is that I can brag to my friends and say, hey, look, I've got a telephone. There it is. But yeah, no, there's not much value in that. But if somebody else gets a telephone, and we're tied into the same network, now the value of my phone just went up by one unit. I can call that one other person. And think about the second telephone that gets purchased. Now there are, there are three telephones, each one has two units of value associated with it. So I went from um, each phone having one unit of value, that's two, to each of the three phones having two units of value, so that's six, and now when I add in four, I've got three units of value on each of the four, that's 12. So we're growing exponentially here. That's what's happening. And it's just because other people are buying into the same thing I bought into. We see this happen with other kinds of technologies, like the web. Now, let's see here. What age are you all? So you probably, you were kids when the web became available for commercial use. And do you remember that? Or, or were you too young for that? Have you grown up with the web all your life? Yes? <laughs> okay, oh, dang it, I'm, so, I'm too old. <laughs> okay, the web 
very quickly uh, evolved to a standard. So, well, okay, I'm not going to go into that. But Windows maybe is one that you understand. How many are running a Windows desktop right now, right today? How many are running a Macintosh desktop? Okay. So it used to be, you know, 10 years ago, Windows held sort of a monopoly. Everybody had standardized. All of the business world had standardized on Windows. And that's still the case in many companies today. Uh, Macintosh has about 10% of the U.S. market now. So they've made, a, they've made big inroads. But you can see the percentage in college students is much higher than that. So, um, okay, let's talk about why it is that some of these things become sort of the de facto standard. First of all, uh, Robert Metcalf is the founder of 3Com. He invented the Ethernet protocol that we used for communicating. That's what the original Internet was kind of built on, largely. He created a law where he said, the value of a network increases in proportion to the square of the number of users. That just means what I said earlier. Over time, as more people come in, we have an exponential growth curve of value. What happens is the initial cost to develop this network is large, but the incremental cost is small to add another user. If you want Google Fiber, how much does it cost you? There is a free version. What is, what is the installation fee? 30 bucks? That's not much. How much did it cost Google to build the network? Well, actually, Google didn't build it. They bought it from Provo, who had built it. But I mean, it was, that was a lot of money. Initial cost was large, but now the incremental cost to add a user is small. That sets up the condition for a network effect. And what happens is you get this comparative feedback loop that happens, uh, like on iPhone. Users like to buy iPhone because lots of developers write software for the iPhone. How many apps in the App Store? We used to count that, and I think we've lost count. Uh, but Apple made billions and billions of dollars off of the App Store last year. Developers like to write software for the iPhone because lots of users buy it. And so you get into this feedback loop, this cycle that very quickly iterates to a winner takes all. That happened with Microsoft Windows. Same sort of thing. The user said, where are the most programs available? And it turned out to be Windows. And the developer said, where are the most users? And it turned out to be Windows. And it kind of cycled on itself. And it was very tough for Apple. And they're still digging into that market, trying to raise the market share of MacBooks and uh, Mac desktops. Um, anyway, so you get this winner-take-all situation when you have a network effect. And any time you can create these circumstances, that is a better scalable tech play. OK, think about social networks for a minute. What social networks do you use? Shout them out. Facebook. Facebook. Instagram. Instagram. Twitter. Twitter. LinkedIn. LinkedIn. Snapchat. Reddit. Sorry? Reddit. 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 OK, the list isn't very big. There's not room for a lot. How many of you use Facebook? How many of you use Twitter? OK, fewer hands. Or quite a lot fewer hands. How many of you use Instagram? OK, more than Twitter. How many use Pinterest? See a lot of women raising their hands, not a lot of guys. I signed up for Pinterest the other day, letting my feminine side out. Anyway, um, I was looking for a picture of organizers, and that led me to Pinterest, and I had to sign up to get the image I wanted. Anyway, I'm, I wear pink shirts sometimes, too. It's OK. <laughs> um, so how much room is there for another social network? Uh, not a lot. I mean, if, if you find the right area, so Instagram found its niche because that's photos, just sharing photos. Pinterest found its niche. And anyway, th there are niches that you can attack. And, and maybe you can build a beachhead there and build out from there. But there's a network effect in place here. Facebook owns that market. Now, they, they will lose share to certain people some places. But Facebook is the big boy in, in social networks. OK, you want to try to create a network effect. Second big principle, principles of disruptive innovation. Now, Clayton Christensen, he's LDS and at Harvard, he wrote this book on uh, um, principles of disruptive innovation. And he pointed out to the world that, so he was studying floppy disk drives. Have any of you ever used a floppy disk? OK, so I'm not that old. All right, good. What size of floppy disks have you used? 
Okay, there are three and a half inch, there are five and a quarter inch. Three and a half, the little hard shell, three and a half. Anybody use the five inch discs that are kind of floppy with a soft case? A few hands going up. Okay, um, well, guess what? Before five and a quarter inch discs, there were eight inch floppies. And before that, there were others. And Clayton studied the technology that was uh, occurring in the floppy disk storage area. And he discovered the manufacturer who makes the next technology is not the one who's making the current technology. The one who displaces the eight inch floppy is a different manufacturer. And the same thing happened in other technology arenas that he explored and pretty soon he discovered, you know what, there are some innovations that are disruptive in the sense that they displace an entrenched technology completely and it was a totally other company that figured out this innovation that displaced the entrenched performer. The reason that, there, that this happens is not because the new one performs better, it's because it provides a better value. What's happening is we're changing the basis on which we're competing with other products. So how does this work? Okay, every technology has a trajectory. Over time, the demand of the market goes up. And there's a range, there's the, the high end and the low end. And you know, this is the, the traditional market here. Think about cars for a second. How many of you have power windows on your car? Okay, when I was your age, power windows on a car was a luxury that a college student probably didn't have. And a remote lock and unlock, that was a luxury as well. We'd heard of them, but you know, that was something your mom and dad got that you didn't get. You had to roll down your window, okay, sorry, uphill in both directions. Okay, over time, cars get better. If you bought a car today and it didn't have power windows and power locks, you'd kind of scratch your head and say, huh, that's maybe not a great car. I just bought a new car a few months ago and it's loaded with technology and I love it. And definitely over time, my taste and demand has gone up. Well, my ability to pay has gone up too, so that's fortunate, a fortunate coincidence. Um, so what happens with an entrenched technology? An existing technology goes through this trend. Over time, there are more and more features that are added to that product. So this, this dimension here is product performance. The product gets better and better and better over time. Think about word processors, where they were when you first started in school typing up your reports, and where are they today? So today, you can go to Google Docs and you can edit a document collaboratively. Today, if you install Microsoft Word, there are so many features. Uh, nobody here knows all of the features of Microsoft Word or Excel or any of those other things. Over time, products get better and better and better. At some point, do they exceed the, uh, the demand of the market? Is a Ferrari better than what the market demands for a car at the high end? Does anybody here have, okay, I shouldn't ask that, but I doubt anybody here has a Ferrari. It's way above the market range that we typically talk about. That's an outlier. Um, and that happens in all technologies. Now along comes a disruptive innovation of some sort. It enters into the uh, market here and, and it gets released and it starts following a technology progression trend, a trajectory here. When it first comes into the market right here, we compare it with the entrenched technology. The entrenched technology is pretty good. Everybody's buying it. It's very valuable. And this one, this new disruptive innovation, it's way below what the low end is expecting. It's not even as good as the low end. And we laugh at it and we say, oh, that's never gonna go anywhere. Who wants a black and white five inch television that, um, you know, it's battery powered, it gets just local broadcast stations, who wants that? Over time, you evolve that thing and they're developing their technology as well as the entrenched performer continues to develop. Look what happens when this guy enters the low end. Where is the entrenched technology? Way above what the market demands. And what does that kind of imply? It kind of implies that the entrenched technology is gonna be a little bit expensive. Somehow you have to pay for all that functionality. You have to pay for the feature set. What happens here is that at this point, the disruptive technology is much, a much better value proposition than the entrenched one. And so people start to say, huh, you know, a few years ago I mocked the Yugo, and now today, well, I still mock the Yugo. Um, pick a different example. Oh, when I was a kid, Toyota or Honda was not a quality car. How about 
a Hyundai. A Hyundai was not, back in the day, not a very quality car. How many of you have a, a Korean car today? I would imagine a number of you do, maybe more than are raising their hands. Korean cars are pretty high quality now. Toyotas and Hondas are kind of the standard bearers today. That's what happens over time. You get disruption, and things that you thought before were just not even good enough, well, now all of a sudden they're good and they're a pretty good value as well. So look for principles of disruptive innovation. You want to be a market disruptor. Whoops, I uh, hit the wrong thing. Okay, you want to be a market disruptor, and you want to be able to present your, you, you want to be able to take over a marketplace. And so you want to study the forces that exist in that market and say, how could I go serve some segment of, okay, let me go back to this slide. How does this work? How can you afford to spend this time in the lower part of the technology trajectory? Do you just raise millions of dollars and have some investors pay so that you can get through that stage? Sometimes that works, but sometimes what you do is you go to a, to a market where you're not competing against the entrenched technology. What you're doing is you're competing against the uh, lack of ability to use the technology at all. Maybe you go to some other country where they don't have the level of technology that exists in the developed world, and you start serving them there. And you go, you go find an adjacent space to do that development work in and make some money, and then all of a sudden you're ready to attack the mainstream market. So understanding principles of disruptive innovation means that you need to really look carefully at the structure of your market and see, how could I do this learning over in this adjacent space and then be ready to hop over to the mainstream space when the time is right? And now companies teach their managers to, to be on the lookout for these disruptive technologies. But it's really, really hard if you're the entrenched player to disrupt yourself. And so there's still a lot of opportunity for outside disruptors to come in. Okay, anyway, that's a, that's a term you'll hear and I hope it's one that you have at least a little bit more familiarity with. There are some great books where you can read about this stuff. Go look up Clayton Christensen on the web and you'll find uh, several books that he's written about that. And there's a ton more to say about it too. Okay, Moore's Law. So, 1965, that was the year I was born, so this observation is as old as I am. Gordon Moore, who was the co-founder of Intel, and you're all using Intel technology today, he observed that about every 24 months, and some people say he said 18 to 24 months, but it's about every 24 months, he said, the number of transistors on an integrated circuit about doubles. Now, if you go to Wikipedia, you'll find a graph kind of like this. This is what we call a log linear graph. That means that on the left-hand side, the axis is logarithmic. So it goes 10,000, 100,000, a million, 10 million, 100 million, a billion, okay? It's going up logarithmically. So if I were to plot, the, so it's, it's linear on this plot, but if I were to number this um, so that the scale here was, was uh, sequential, sorry, uh, was a linear scale, not a logarithmic scale, you would see a curve that just goes whoop, just right up off the page. Very steep growth curve. So by compacting it, we can see that every 24 months, that's the dotted line here, every 24 months, these dots, which represent actual Intel processors, about follow this, this doubling of the number of transistors on a chip. Now, if you double transistors on a chip, what, what can you do? Well, we'll talk about that in a second here. Let me tell you a little story. The emperor of China met the inventor of the game of chess. Now, this might be urban legend, I don't know. But anyway, bear with me. Emperor of China met the inventor of the game of chess and he said, oh man, I love this game of chess. This is a very cool game. I'll give you whatever you'd like. Um, so you just tell me what you want. And the inventor thinks, hmm, I'd like one grain of rice. And the emperor goes, well, what, are you disrespecting? I, I can give you all kinds of stuff. I want one grain of rice, he says, for the first square on the chessboard. I want two grains of rice for the second square, four for the third square, and so forth until we've covered the whole board, doubling on each square. And the emperor of China foolishly agreed, and then he realized, I can't deliver on that promise after he tried to carry it out. How many grains of rice are we talking about on that pattern? No 
So the first row, 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, 128, 256. Then we go up to, so 2 to the 8th power is 256, and that's what you land after, on after 8 squares. And after uh, 16 squares, 2 to the 16th is 65,536. After you get to 64 squares, 2 to the 64th is a number bigger than the number of grains of rice that have ever existed in the history of the earth. Okay? Uh, it cannot be done. That's what doubling does to us. Now, think back to when Gordon Moore observed this. This was 1965, which means I'm, kind of, I'm turning 50 this year. Uh, what a wonderful year. I have experienced in my lifetime 25 doublings. What's 2 to the 25th? Anybody have a calculator handy? Or we could ask Google, I suppose. 2 to the 25th? Thirty-three and a half million. That sounds about right. Thirty-three and a half million. Okay, in my lifetime, computers have gotten thirty-three and a half million times faster. Now, uh, that's kind of cool. What you can do when you have more transistors on a chip is you can do these things. You can increase the amount of computation that you can do, or you can increase the amount of storage that you can have. So on my iPhone 6 biggie size, um, I have 64 gigabytes of storage. That's a ton. When smartphones first came out, what was the storage size of these things? A couple of gigabytes, eight gigabytes was kind of big back in the early days. Okay, so now a few years later, here we're talking 64, and this is kind of a, a medium sized storage. Uh, there's much higher capacity out there. You can put more bits, you can store more bits in your devices if you have more transistors on your integrated circuits. We can have faster network transmissions. And what's happening here is all of these trends are happening at the same time. We're increasing our computational power. We're increasing our network connectivity. You can now stream things on Netflix. I used to wonder, man, why would I want fiber coming to my home? But guess what? I'm really jealous of all you Provoites who have Google Fiber. I really want Google Fiber, but I live in North Orem. Um, so uh, anyway, but we can store more, we can transmit more, and it all costs less. 30 bucks connection fee, and you can get a free uh, subscription to, to Google Fiber? I mean, that's amazing to me. I can drive down I-15 and be connected to the network? Are you kidding me? Okay. So what happens here is we get this interesting cascade. We increase our speed and capacity and we lower the cost of our technology. We process information faster as a result of putting that investment in. Because we're processing our information faster, we can rethink our operating procedures. We can innovate. We can say, hey, you know what? It's possible to have a camera on my cell phone. And what does that do to the world? All of a sudden, we're taking pictures of everything. We're taking videos of everything. It affects our social world and our political world as well as everything else. I can now Instagram things, and uh, I can share my vacation photos kind of real time, or anything that I'm doing kind of real time. We rethink, we innovate. We develop new goods and services because we have come up with new ideas for new applications of this stuff. We then, hopefully, we get a network effect that is going to kind of give us a, a groundswell of demand. I mean, that happened to Instagram. That's why they were worth so much. It's happened to a bunch of companies. We, because of that, we say, hey, I've got some money here. I better spend some more money on research and development. And that gives me the next set of advances that's going to let me increase speed and capacity and lower cost. And we go through this cycle over and over and over again. This has been happening my whole life. And it's been happening your whole life and it will continue to happen. Rapid innovation. And the thing is that it's not just happening in, a tech, in technology, it's also happening in business. We're going through faster business cycles now, too. Companies that are dominant today are not going to be dominant necessarily in another 10 years. When I say the words IBM, what do you think of? Do you think of a technology powerhouse? Kind of, sort of. You think mouses? Okay, IBM used to be the king. 
30 years ago, they were the king. Microsoft kind of displaced them. Is Microsoft the big powerhouse now? They're st still formidable, but who's your powerhouse? Apple. How about Google? You know, Google affects our consumer behavior. Every one of us modify the way we purchase things because we can go to Google and type stuff in and get feedback from other people. So anyway, business is starting to change just as rapidly as technology has been. And so this new generation needs to be able to do these things right here. I think that all of us need to figure out, how am I adding value in my organization? I don't think it's good enough. Back in the day, maybe in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, you could go to work and you could say, I'm gonna work for this big company, I'm gonna do what the boss tells me, I'm gonna be nine to five and I'm gonna come home and not think about work one bit and I'm gonna have my, my home life and I'm gonna keep it totally separate from my work life and next uh, morning at nine o'clock I'll be back to doing what the boss tells me to do. It'll be an interesting and a productive career. That is not the world you live in today. I think today you have to seek out ways that you're gonna add value in your organization. You need to understand how you're gonna be, how you're gonna impact the direction your company is going. You ought to understand the strategic vision of your, of your company. And don't get siloed. Don't just be a tech guru, don't just be a whatever. You need to, you need to have a broader vision of what's happening and interact with that vision and see how you add value. You guys ought to be particularly good at how to, uh, figuring out how to apply technology to solve problems. You have so many tools at your disposal today, and that list is gonna keep on growing. Um, I, I'm just, I'm amazed as I think about all of the innovations that are coming out here. So I would say think creatively so that your organization can compete better in the marketplace. And if your organization is a startup that you're running, I mean, this is all the more important. The other thing I think is gonna happen to you is that you're gonna need to retool yourselves over and over again. Now, I'm doing that in my academic career. When I started, we had no idea about iPhone or iOS or things like that. I mean, that wasn't even on the horizon. But I'm working very hard to keep myself current in that space because I see that as a very important area. And I'm gonna continue to put a lot of energy into that. And at the same time, I'm gonna keep my eyes open for what other things are on the horizon and how do I need to retool. Um, Okay, you might even have to invent your own job, but that's a discussion for another day, I suppose. So, lessons learned. What do you wanna walk away from this presentation with? Number one, I think you need to understand your business environment is evolving rapidly. Partly that's influenced by technology, but your environment is, is evolving very rapidly. How many have he heard of uh, cloud computing or virtualization of servers or things like that? iCloud, Google Docs, Drive, um, Dropbox, that's the cloud. And that's a fairly recent innovation, but that's gonna have a very far reaching impact on things. Sometimes you'll hear some of our speakers talk about software as a service. Have you heard that term before, software as a service, SaaS? What that means is that instead of installing software on every individual computer, like if I wanna install Chrome on here, I download Chrome and I install it on my laptop. That's not software as a service. Software as a service is like Salesforce where what happens is I go to the Salesforce website, I log in, and I use their stuff through my web browser. And that's the better way today to develop a technology-based uh, startup because it's so scalable. You don't have to ship out uh, product to different customers. You know, if, if you've got millions of people who are downloading Chrome and you wanna update it, what happens? you got millions of people who have to go download and install the update. Now maybe it happens automatically or maybe there's just a little uh, dialog box that says, hey, do you wanna update this? There's an update available. But still it has to happen on every machine. Whereas with software as a service, you install it on your servers, you save yourselves a world of trouble uh, by just updating the server. So that's on the rise and that's something to look for. Social networking, I think we are still at the beginnings of what we can see so social networking do. We've recently heard from Elder Bednar and others about social networking in the gospel context. I think we're gonna continue to see that flourish and develop. We're planning a stake youth conference in my stake and that's one of the topics is how do we do something around social networking to help the youth 
sort of integrate some of the ideas on that. Um, mobile, I think, is a game changer as well. We've had laptops for a while, a couple of decades. Actually, when I first came here to BYU, it was not common to have a laptop. That was kind of a luxury item. But today, you almost hardly ever buy a desktop machine. Does anybody here own a desktop? Yeah, okay, a few hands. There are a few of those, but most of you are running on laptops. The interesting thing about mobile, and, and if, if we have a speaker drop out later in the semester, then I've got a great lecture on, on this subject right here, mobile devices, uh, how to develop for them, what, what it means to, um, well, what, what the context of where business is. The fact that your phone knows where you are, that's a huge deal. The fact that it has your calendar. So, little story here. I was a, a year or two ago, no, a couple of years ago probably, probably two years ago. I was using my Android phone before I got an iPhone. I was using my Android phone, and all of a sudden it would buzz me and it would say, Tanner has a meeting in 10 minutes and you need to leave for this meeting. And I'd look at my calendar and I'd say, wait, that's not me, and that's not my event. What was happening was my Google Calendar was saying, you're sharing a calendar with Tanner, and he's put a location on that event. And I know where that event is, and I know where you are, and I know you need to leave now in order to get to that event. That was a pretty cool thing that was a location context awareness thing. Your Android phone, so Apple isn't doing this yet, but your Android phone can buzz you and say, better leave at 20 till in order to get to your appointment at the top of the hour because it's keeping track of all of these things. Well, that's one small example. There's a lot that can happen in, in this arena here. And I think if you want to look for a good opportunity, mobile is an excellent place to look for that opportunity. So, this semester, what I'd like, what I would hope you would walk away from this talk thinking about is, you're going to watch for these principles. You're going to watch for network effect, disruptive innovations, Moore's Law, the use of socially networked and mobile technology. I hope that what you're going to do is you're going to think about how you transform, innovate, and build. I hope that the out-of-class activities are going to encourage you, incentivize you to get involved someplace. And we have a ton of resources available for you. So here's my contact info. This will be on the slides that get posted. We have a great website at learnerandreturn.com and at getmentoring.com. And please let us know if the center can be a resource to you. Thank you, and we'll see you next week.